All right, so today we're going to be talking about a chess game. Now, if you like chess, you probably know what the Sicilian defense is or the Queen's Gambit or all of those things for great chess players. Well, today we're going to be talking about chess moves that are happening within the financial, rena- I think, re- renaissance of what uh, may be the future of Web3 and also crypto in general. So hopefully this will come together for you guys. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back into Tech Path. Um, there's a few things happening around not only the moves by the SEC, but also the governing bodies that really, you know, kind of control what's happening in crypto in general. But more importantly is the fact that we're getting a lot more lawmakers involved in this. And we anticipated this. Yes, all of this is going to start flowing into uh, maybe a new future here. So and I think there's good and there's also areas to be concerned as well. So the key here is just be aware. Uh, Before we get started, I want to thank our uh, sponsor, and that is Ledger. If you are looking to enter the world of digital assets, uh, get protected by security you can see, feel, and touch uh, using the new Ledger stacks. And what I would do is take a look at the stacks. Just go over to Ledger. You'll learn quickly a little bit more about the Ledger stacks. You can pre-order this. It should be arriving soon, so uh, make sure and jump in on that. Self-custody is one of the things I coach and talk about here on the channel quite a bit. And of course, Ledger is one of the best places to start. If you're looking for your hardware devices, this is the place. Go over and hit that link down below. Uh, It does help the channel out, so we appreciate it. All right, so a couple of things I'm going to get into is um, CPI first. We'll talk about CPI. Uh, This, of course, uh, uh, the January uh, CPI inflation uh, rises 6.4 year over year. Uh, Estimated was around 6.2. Previous was 6.5, so we're down a little bit. Uh, But overall, um, in the essence of where the trends have gone, it's slowed. So that is a concern possibly that could play into Chair Powell and his assessment of where the market data is coming. But remember, we had that hotter than hot jobs report a couple of weeks ago. Uh, The question will be whether or not that can can still hold sustainability around the market in general. Uh, But at the same time, we're also seeing some cooling in other aspects of the industry around the economic conditions of the U.S. So it's going to be an interesting point. It, the good thing was is crypto responded somewhat positively. Um, S&P was kind of flat and neutral on this, but I think long term, this isn't necessarily going to be the thing that affects crypto or the S&P uh, you know, for the most part. The bigger picture here is going to be regulation what we're going to see in these liquidity markets, and then obviously the macro pressures that we'll continue to see in the economic structure of how the economy is doing. So uh, this was, uh, you know, kind of talking about here, CPA came in hotter or higher than expected. A few months ago would have nuked the market, but equities and stable uh, and crypto is pushing a little bit higher. Very interesting. And I would agree with this on on Mamba because it is a, um, it is an interesting thing. The point is, is it's still down. That's the good part. Uh, it's not continuing to streak down, but think about this for a second. Jobs report came in, you know, far surpassing anything that was anticipated or forecasted. Even with that far surpass, uh, even though wages were down, the amount of jobs were up, significant amount. Even with that, we only saw a one point decline and we didn't see a lift. That to me is still a very strong position, I think, overall for the CPI. So, Just one to think about. Um, We're going to play, skip through that one. I'm going to go on to this here. Dow drops 100 points after hotter than expected. Uh, 100 points, yes, uh, but the January CPI report, we'll look at some of this on the the charts today as well. Uh, But in general, not massive reaction to this. And again, I think the bigger picture is going to be some of the macro elements that will start to play out going into the summer. Back to what we talk about here on the channel all the time. And that is about mid-year, we could be seeing something very interesting happening in crypto along with other areas. Now, with all of that, you know, the CPI, uh, potentially where we're going to be going with the FOMC on next month, also cycles around, uh, just in general, I think, the size of and the challenge that we're dealing with a lot of different influential factors, credit, jobs, etc., that play into the macro landscape. This, I think, is going to be uh, one to really kind of piece together with other things that are happening. Now, you've got the economy. You can set it over on this side of your desk. Now, let's go over and talk about regulation for a second. 
I want to jump to a tweet right here by Eleanor Tarrant. Again, um, has become a little bit of a, uh, a rock star, I think, in reporting on, on crypto in general over at Fox. And uh, she's basically talking about the Senate banking hearing. We'll hear from Duke Law, uh, uh, Lee Reiners, uh, also other things. All, all of this is really gearing up around the SEC's power on stable coins. Now, the, le- the next couple of qu- clips will explain a little bit about what the, the crypto crash hearing was really focused in on. The good news, and I'll give you that, I'll give you a spoiler alert. The good news is that there's a lot more people leveraging for crypto than there are against. Now, there are certain people in power that still push for more power, which is always my recommendation. Follow the power, follow the money. Uh, These two clips, I think, will kind of help explain that. Here's this first one. Let's play this one. Cryptocurrency. Unfortunately, Our regulators have muddied the waters. We have been told everything from we need legislation to more recently that regulators have the tools they need to supervise this industry. That is quite a flip-flop. Once again, it is really important that we have Chair Gensler here before September. It is far too far in the future for us to wait that long before we hear from Chairman Gensler. The regulators have permitted activity in this space without providing clear rules of the road, which has unfortunately led to the multiple failures that brings us here today. Let's be clear. Had the SEC provided anything besides hostility to the crypto industry, we may have been able to save investors from losing billions of dollars on FTX, Celsius, BlockFi, and the list goes on. So my question, Professor Jing, All right, so I'm going to cut it there because we've got another clip that will give some response to this. But he hit on a a lot of very interesting points. Again, uh, someone, Mr. Scott here, uh, that is looking at the market and saying, hey, you know, there's guidance here. There's opportunity here for the U.S. in terms of innovation. There's regulatory opportunity here with just, you know, basic rules that usually every business entity in the entire United States abides by, no matter what you are. If you're an LLC, a C-Corp, you have certain legislation uh, guidance that you have. If you're going into IPO or even uh, private offerings, you have vehicles in which you can do that. That's the thing that's missing here. And I think that Congress and uh, our lawmakers in general are starting to understand that. I think it's been clear, but now they're really kind of gravitating to the point that this is a power grab uh, happening right there in front of them. Here's this next one. Uh, this is Professor uh, Linda Jang. She, she makes a good point here. She makes several good points throughout this. I would suggest spend some time, go to the Senate Banking Committee, holds a crypto crash hearing video over there by Fox Business, and you can kind of learn a little bit more if you want to listen to the whole For example, hour and a half. I give you a, a green paper a dollar bill, uh, you know when you take it from me that nobody has an interest or title to that dollar bill. That's why it acts so well as a medium of exchange to ensure that we will have a digital economy that can run on digital money. We need to make sure that fiat backed stable coins and other types of, of uh, digital money that could include CBDC as well are also going to be free of interest or title and hence why putting it under the uh, SEC framework was problematic because, again, you know, I cannot pay you um, with a security. All right. So very straightforward, very simplistic in explanation of how securities work and how securities law potentially could work around stable coins. And again, Professor Jang is a proponent for the idea of free market flow and the idea of stable coins are just that, stable coins who are pegged to the right kind of stable coins, pegged to uh, the US dollar and or other uh, assets that equal that. Now you look into what happened over here at the, the hearing, then you think about where are the puzzle pieces starting to play out here and really what is at stake here? Because right right now, this is something that we talk about on the channel often, is the timing. Timing right now is super critical. Thing I say all the time is remember in a bear market, in the downtrend, that's when most of the capitulation starts to occur. These scoops off the bottom, like what we've been experiencing, are starting to indicate bullish markers. Bullish markers start to draw in, guess what? The players. And the players typically are going to be banks, institutions, 
and the federal government. Now you start to see why all of a sudden you've got these actions and these things like Wells notices, et cetera, being served out to Paxos. So Paxos says right here, it's prepared to vigorously fight the SEC lawsuit. A couple of points I'll highlight. They disagreed with the SEC's belief that the Binance uh, USD token is a security stating that's prepared to vigorously litigate the disagreement if it's forced to. And again, this will be still uh, a scenario that could be playing out. And why is the SEC issuing these Wells notices like, you know, Cracker Jacks? I just don't understand if they don't have a full intention of executing on this. What's the purpose? Are there other potential power scenarios playing out? If you follow government in general, and I think you guys understand, all you have to do is follow the money and then follow the power players behind that. And that typically points to at least a framework of why things are happening. Doesn't necessarily give you the full picture of the exact reason, because that usually is tied to something much more deep and usually a lot more dark. But this is the point that I think we're going to start seeing, and that is Binance Stablecoin under fire. Uh, this is rival circle sounds the alarm to the New York regulators. And there was a couple of things here that was in the article. Um, U.S.-based payments company issued, uh, this is USDC, alleged that, you know, obviously uh, the, major, the major crypto exchange Binance did not fully back some of its own stablecoin proxies. Circle alerted the New York watchdog, found it had some discrepancies. Again, why is Circle getting into this? Again, you had uh, scenarios that even CZ has responded to this in the past. Then you had this consumer alert right here, notice regarding Paxos issued BUSD. It's important to note that the Department of Authorized, that the Department authorized Paxos to issue BUSD on the Ethereum blockchain. The Department has not authorized a Binance Peg BUSD on any blockchain, and Binance Peg BUSD is not issued by Paxos. Hence, meaning that once that it gets into a certain state, the BUSD token then that's when it starts to violate these securities laws. So that's the scenario that's starting to play out here. And then, of course, you have Circle involved into all this. Uh, let me jump to that clip, because this was the, the piece we showed earlier uh, in the week, I think, on when we were talking about stable coins, was this piece right here of depegging and Tether really after kind of this whole minting uh, ceased. Let me go over to this piece right here. This came from Wu Blockchain. All right, so in response to Bloomberg's early report that Circle reported BUSD to uh, the NYDFS, CZ expressed in the AMA that he did not believe that Circle would do so because doing so would also hurt themselves. Binance hopes to continue cooperation with the Indian partners. Now, I hear that and I understand, you know, we follow Wu Blockchain and, uh, and Willie is, does a great job on analysis. I don't know that I necessarily agree with that because I feel like Circle and you know, Binance are still at odds. This is still a stablecoin race. The question will be is how that plays out. Here was the clip that he was talking about. Let me play this. I'll re... I'll get this for you guys. Hang on one second. And sometimes it will... Here we go. So Calvin omitted the fact that there's no records. That's not a problem to him. So he just want to talk to Sam and believe whatever Sam says. He doesn't want to look at the records. And if you look, and he wants to omit all the small spendings, $50 million, $200 million, $200 million of small spending, that's very convenient. He says he didn't know that Binance was a shareholder of FTX. So he invested in FTX without looking at the cap table. But he was very specific in the way he counts for a transaction two years ago. So that's kind of contradictory. So um, I think Calvin's a liar. So um, I think he's lying about, about a bunch of stuff. So that's okay, his but problem. To us... We want to be transparent. We want to set the golden standard for reliability, solidness in the so space. Do it. So, and we're so, all right. So a lot, a lot there. Uh, obviously, the Kevin O'Leary connection. I'll show you a, a, a piece where Kevin responds to that here in a second. Um, but the point is, is that BUSD and in general, you look at the what we're trying to understand is why are these kinds of plays taking place in a market that should be going forward to try to get either regulatory environment in line, but it feels like there's a lot of infighting. Um, if you look at Autism Capital, they talk about Kevin O'Leary basically threatening CZ called me a liar, don't mess with me, I'm Irish and I'm crazy. This was of course uh, O'Leary saying this. Uh, do we wanna play that clip? <laughs> no, you know, it's the typical O'Leary rhetoric. 
The other thing that I want to jump to is uh, some of the connection points on this. And this, let me go to the headline for you right here. Circle begins putting reserves into a new BlackRock fund. And there's some, I think there's some alignment here with O'Leary. BlackRock, Circle, remember Circle was being touted heavily by O'Leary last year. And now that we understand his kind of mode of operation, especially around FTX, it makes me believe that maybe there's some underlying effect of the connection between O'Leary, Circle, and BlackRock. So let's look at, uh, further into this. USDC will finish moving into a SEC-regulated money market fund early next year. This was done on November 3rd, 2022. So this may be the reason that Circle has not been served a Wells notice is because of something that they may have negotiated with the SEC or in some way attorneys to align Circle into a regulated money market fund. Further into the article, it's talking about the reserve fund. This is government money market fund managed by BlackRock Advisors. All right. Circle also will be its only eligible investor because the ultimate goal is for BlackRock to apply in time to get the fund into a Federal Reserve reverse repo program. Gets into more. And then he said, the current circulation of around 43 bill uh, is in USDC is backed by 44 bill in cash and short-term U.S. government bonds. No problem. Portfolio of the new fund will also consist of treasury bonds. The, the assets will be held by the Bank of, of NY Mellon, according to Circle, where the funds will be subject to Regulation, regulation Investment Company Act of 1940. No problem. Circle had previously begun financial relationship with BlackRock, the world's biggest asset manager, when the firm just kept going. So there's a tie-in right there that kind of plays into this for you of where all this is going. Now you've got, uh, of course, BitBoy coming in to say, if you think the SEC is going after Circle and USDC, then you have to, you, they have you right where you want. Uh, SEC is not going to ban USDC. They're clearing the path for it. There's also that kind of scenario where USDC could be lining up as maybe the Fed coin or a digital dollar in some format. Lots happening here. Then you've got Duo9. He goes in, same thing. Uh, Stablecoin guide, in case you missed it, uh, seems relevant today. BUSD was labeled security. USDC and USDT, uncertain. Uh, suspect USDC won't get any heat because it's a BlackRock Fidelity pet. US has all the reasons to defend it and crush competitors. Gets back into this whole scenario. Is there some sort of rub between this? Now, why does all this matter? Why does any of this really matter when it comes down to stablecoins? Because the alignment of regulatory guidance is going to play into a big, big part of how we'll see major adoption in this space. And it will start with a stablecoin. That's where it's going to get very interesting because if, if USDC or unlikely tether, but if USDC does come out and become the golden child, think about adoption, not you and I, that know kind of what's happening here in the space, but all the massive amount of investors that are gonna to look to this and say, we have our first regulated stablecoin, and it's a US stablecoin. And now I'm ready to put money in that and then start investing into the blockchain industry or in crypto in general. So it definitely plays out in a very interesting way. Of course, they wanna push the US to use the USDC. It's basically a Fed coin. This is talking about Circle putting reserves into the BlackRock fund we talked about earlier. Deepening our, deepening our partnership with BlackRock, more on that. So it really starts to play into that. Now let's take a look at um, where does this play out for BlackRock themselves? This was a piece by uh, Peter McCormick, uh, What Bitcoin Did podcast. And he's asking some questions specifically to Kevin O'Leary. Let me play this clip. Actually coming from, is it, is it just themselves as a, as a I think you I think you can blame Larry Fink's letter okay. each year. And I think he's a genius because he sets the mandate for the global consideration at the board level of ESG. You should probably explain who Larry Fink is. Well, the largest know. asset manager on earth is mm -hmm. BlackRock. And he writes a letter each year and he sends it to every CEO of a company he's invested in. And it basically sets the rules by which they should govern their companies regarding sustainability and climate change and all kinds of other issues that Larry believes in. Now you can ignore it at your peril, because if he puts a position on in your company, he's going to be one of the largest shareholders, period. And so he's on a mission, and I, I think it's a noble one. He himself has to struggle with the definition of what ESG is, 
but he has changed the tonality of the S&P 500 in just 36 months. And the reason, and I'll give you an example. All right, he said something there that I thought was interesting. He changed the tonality of the S&P 500. Those are the largest companies in the world in 36 months. Again, this can only come from someone who has that much power and that much control. So if USDC is the golden child of BlackRock, which it is, and we see the potential for ESG involvement, you start to learn, and, and what he talks about with uh, O'Leary was talking about there is this letter that goes out. We, I think we reported this last year, um, is this ESG idea of where BlackRock was trying to position. It did a lot for the electric car markets, electrification, all those kind of things we, we've reported on here. But the point is, is that when Fink speaks, these companies most likely have to listen, meaning that there's so much investment in these kinds of uh, initiatives that it's kind of his way or the highway kind of th scenario, or you end up in a bad position with, uh, with Fink. So again, this goes back into follow the money, follow the power. And when I think about who's trying to control the next evolution of finance, you can really only point to one company right now, and that's most likely going to be BlackRock. How they're going to invest in it, the companies they're going to invest in, and the veins in which they're going to articulate the ability to construct legislation. And this means maybe even control of things like the SEC, etc. It's all political play. This is a chess game, as I mentioned in the beginning, and we are beginning to start to see some of these early moves because now is when we're three, four moves in and the game is getting interesting. Further in this update on Binance's outflows. This just kind of shows you a little bit here. Outflows near a billion dollars in 24 hours. Uh, both BNB and BUSD see dramatic drawdowns. This is going back into the optics. I know that the scenario is that Binance is, yes, it's just a brand and you know, skeleton by name only that Paxos is working with and that, you know, true BUSD still a separate kind of token. But the fact is, is that the optics here for Binance from a global perspective are starting to look different than that of other stable coins and or maybe other exchanges. You got to think about Coinbase's relationship here and obviously Circle all tied together. And then you plug in BlackRock and Fink and now you have a puppet master potentially uh, doing his thing. Here's Coinbase seeing massive USDC inflows. Boom, boom, boom. And so the chess ploys begin. And USDC seeing inflows, uh, Coinbase obviously seeing a big part of that. That's a good thing. More assets under Coinbase. Coinbase stock go up. You start to see the, the pictures. Kathy Wood starts to see all of her assets go up. Now we got Wall Street involved. Here we go. Just as a reminder, this is the proof of collateral for BTOKEN. Uh, note that this is only referring to the Binance Bridge PEG tokens. This is not the proof of reserve page for Binance.com. So this is their PEG tokens that they work on and, and reporting. And this is kind of the difference between this. This is where it gets super complicated. But what I want you guys to look at is why are all these moves being constructed right now? What is the, there's always a reason there is always a reason. And these are the things I feel that uh, could be playing out. You look at the current market cap of Tether, uh, you know, obviously right there, uh, for right the end of, of end of April 2022, 83 billion market, of course, uh, slid down, but it's starting to see a push up. Then you go to uh, Binance right here on the one year at one time in November, 23 billion. It's now reporting and sliding right now at 15 billion. That's a pretty significant uh, difference. Nine, almost 10 billion in volume. And then you go to USDC. And right here, you start to see this lift because it had hit a bottom right here. Maybe this was the trigger really on uh, yesterday when we started to see some of this, this fall right here, all happening between the week of 210 and now 41 billion down to 40, yeah, right at 40 billion. So that's another billion outflows right there on USDC. And then all of a sudden, bam, USDC jumps right back in at 41 billion. So again, these kind of scenarios, and if you look at BNB, just to go to the chart really quickly, here's the BNB token uh, after the news yesterday uh, or this early this week uh, starting to slide. 
Uh, two big uh, liquidation dumps right there, now trading under $300 where it was pulling up right around almost $335 right there at its high. And if you kind of zoom out on that, look at this right here. This is potentially a problem there again for for uh, BNB. All right. Good stuff. Hopefully this helps you guys at least understanding that w the, the good news on this is that the reason all this is happening is because we're starting to see bullish markers. That's really what it boils down to. The market is coiling up. We're going to start seeing some potential moves, I feel, even though we may have a little bit of pressure from CPI and jobs and those kind of things. But overall, crypto could be in, as they say, crypto spring. I know Raul, Paul, Raul Powell has got uh, that on his mind. And we're going to have Dr. Jeff Ross talking about this uh, actually tomorrow. We've got two big interviews tomorrow. Uh, we'll have our altcoin review tomorrow with Evan. Uh, we're going to do that at 1 o'clock, and then we'll do the 3 o'clock with uh, Jeff Ross talking about Bitcoin and how that might go in forward. Let's go over to the poll real quick and take a look. Which stablecoin do you feel safest with? Interesting. None, 30%. That's interesting. And then uh, USDC holding. So that's mainly, I mean, I would say most of our audience is, is U.S., at least on this show. Um, I guess maybe not because we only have about 50%, but... Interesting that you guys have that. But 30% on no stablecoin. That's interesting. Good. All right, so let's go to some questions. Crypto Bureau says, hey, Paul, is uh, USDP still safe? I don't really use Paxo, so um, I'm more of a, if I am using stablecoins, it's USDC. Uh, I've exited out of BUSD. I had BUSD at one point. It's been a long time since I held BUSD. Um, and Tether, occasionally I hold for short periods, mainly for transactions and trading pairs. There's some things that happen. Uh, did you sell your BNB? BNB, yes, it's, but it also BNB is not in um, our current portfolio right now. I got to look and see and make sure. I know we, we sold it, but uh, I don't think I have it listed in my portfolio as it is right now. Flat smack. Uh, put Kevin O'Leary in, in a cage until we figure out what's going on. He's dangerous. That's a good point. Yeah, this guy is a little, he's a little out there. Uh, inflation uh, didn't exactly fall. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a trending down, yes, but the forecast was expecting a greater adjustment. I, I think this was kind of in line when you think about the amount of jobs, how far we missed the jobs. The forecast on jobs was, was somewhere around 180,000. It ended up being over half a million plus positive jobs. That was a huge miss by the market. And those are the kind of things. So when I see something within two tenths of a point on a target, I'm not so worried as long as we're not seeing additional up, but I am worried about a double dip. So don't, you know, I've talked about this before. I'm worried about a double dip. These are concerns I do have. Obviously the jobs, credit, and also just in general how the macro response on the S&P will be uh, playing this out. Time for Binance to buy a bank. That could be the big deal. And you also might be forcing it. One of the things they said in that, um, in I didn't pull the clip, but one of the things they said in the, Cong or in the crypto crash uh, hearing was uh, is that basically Binance is just laughing all the way to the bank because we're not moving on innovation here in the U.S. So that'll be interesting. Corey says the purpose of the Wells notice is maybe to see what people are most concerned about fighting for. That could be. That's a good strategy for a lot of uh, litigators and, um, you know, in lawsuits and things of that nature. People will lob stuff across the bow to see what is what can I get easy, low hanging fruit, those kind of things. Uh, do you think Gensler will be replaced soon? I think he gets replaced before the next president comes in. I think there's enough pressure from Congress and there's enough pressure from a bipartisan Congress. Uh, and by the way, we just dropped or we just had a big interview with uh, Mance Harmon from Hedera. And uh, we're going to drop that video today at 5 o'clock. You guys don't want to miss that video. There's some interesting stuff in there that Mance and I talk about. And if you are an HBAR follower, don't miss that one. Uh, here we go. Jeff my, uh, Milne it says, I have to eliminate stable coins to allow the injection of their own CBDC. That's a possibility. Could, could circle play into that? You know, chess game, guys. Chess games. You've got to pay attention right now. This is the time, I think, that we're going to really start to see some, uh, some action in the market. Whether Bitcoin starts to see some continued movement here, I think, is still based on macro elements that will play into this. We're going to get more macro analysts on the show to talk about those kind of things. If you guys are not part of our Diamond Circle, make sure and get in. Uh, just join us over on Substack because that's where our Diamond Circle lives, which is PBN3, the number three, 
Substack, you'll find us over there, or you can click the link below and just join over on PaulBarronNetwork.com. It's very easy to do. Lots of stuff we're dropping over there, including an exclusive podcast that I do a couple times a week by myself solo and also with Kyle Wilson on Web3 topics along with other project analysis. So don't miss those. If you guys want to catch me, it's out there on Twitter at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechPath. 